Kalkin Goal is a game designed by Vukashin Nishavic and to be published by Princeps Games through a Kickstarter campaign that begins on October 24. This is a game about the last months of a conflict between Japan and the Soviet Union in the Asian Far East in 1939. And the battle was a consequence of a frontier dispute between both countries near the Kalkin Gold River in Mongolia. The Japanese claimed that the river was the border between Japanese-controlled Manchuria and Soviet Western Mongolia. Soviet troops had occupied the disputed territory between the river and the town of Nomonhan, 20 kilometers to the east, when in May the Japanese launched their attack with one reinforced division. The Japanese were initially successful, but by mid-August, the Soviets launched a counter-offensive with three divisions, five armored brigades, and some Mongolian units, all under the command of Georgi Shukov, and drove the outnumbered Japanese back to Nomonhan. Let's take a look at the game's components with the caveat, of course, that this is a pre-publication copy and therefore components are always subject to change. The game includes one game box, which is four inches deep, and it includes various compartments that are useful to store counters, cards, and play aids. One two-sided mounted map board, and the game will include two versions of the map in different styles, as shown here. There's 24 calendar cards, 9 Soviet and 9 Japanese air battle cards, 7 Soviet and 7 Japanese airstrike cards. The game also includes a deck of general cards for each of the sides. There are various player aids all printed on sturdy die-cut cardboard one combat result table, one Soviet and one Japanese air base strength card, two espionage deception tracks, one for each player, one weather conditions effect summary, and one two-sided player aid card. The game includes 372 counters, the larger counters are three-fourths of an inch, and the smaller ones are half an inch. There are two minimap pads. The game also includes 45 money chits and four dice, an eight-sider, a 12-sider, and two 20-sided dice with results from one to eight. And the game includes one rulebook. The Soviets win if they occupy five of the nine checkpoints in the disputed territory. These are the ones marked with white flags, and holds them until the beginning of the next round, while at the same time controlling at least four of the six checkpoints on Soviet territory. And if the Soviets do not achieve this by the end of the eighth round, the Japanese win the game. This game lasts eight rounds, and each round consists of one Soviet turn, followed by one Japanese turn, and the Soviets go first. Also, the Soviets win the game if they take control of Nomonhan and hold it until the beginning of their next turn. Similarly, the Japanese win if they take control of Tamsak Bulak and hold it until the beginning of their next turn. There are five types of units in the game. Infantry, artillery, tanks, cavalry, and headquarter units. Units have an attack value, a defense value, and units have movement points. These are spent when moving from one hex to another. Artillery also has a range value. This is the distance from which the unit can attack enemy units. 
When calculating combat strengths in this game between units, we take a look at the attacking unit's total attack value and the defending unit's total defense value. The total attack value is the attack value of the unit plus its strength, which is the number of unit counters present in the hex. Here example, we see an infantry unit with four counters. That is a strength of four. It has an attack value of two for a total attack value of six. And it is attacking an artillery unit with two counters. The artillery unit has a defense value of one. So it has a total defense value of three. The game can last up to eight rounds and each round consists of one Soviet turn followed by a Japanese turn. Let's take a look at the game board. The board shows a map of the area around the Kalkingol River in July 1939 and the map is divided into hexes that consist of several terrain types and each terrain type has a specific cost in movement points and an effect on combat. There are clear terrain hexes, high grass, hills, and wetlands. Note that moving from a wetland hex into a hill hex will cost five movement points. There are also checkpoints and roads. The Kalkingol River figures prominently on the map and it is impassable except along Ford hex sides. There's two fords on the Kalkingol. Here's the northern ford. And here we see the southern ford. Crossing at a ford costs an extra two movement points. Players also have the capacity to construct up to two bridges across the Kalkingol with infantry units. And here we see the narrower Holston River, which can be crossed at any point by paying one extra movement point. Political points are adjusted when a player gains or loses checkpoints. Okay, let's set up the game and play one full round. We start by setting up the markers on the political point track. Soviets have 26 political points and the Japanese 25. Here we take out the appropriate number of units and of course a unit is uh, five counters stacked in a hex of the same type. So you have that each side has seven units of infantry. The Soviets have four tank units. The Japanese two. The Soviets have four artillery units. The Japanese three. Each side has one cavalry unit and three headquarters. Next is to fill out the mini-maps. This is the mini-map for the Soviets. This is the one for the Japanese. And here we would write for example, an eye for an infantry unit and uh, where it would start. And then we would set up the game according to the mini maps. But there's another alternate way of setting it up, which is that each side places one unit uh, in alternating fashion, starting with the Soviets. And that's the setup option that we will use. In setup, we cannot place any unit within three hexes of the Kalkin Gold River. And of course, it's one unit per hex. So the Soviets start and place an infantry unit here in this checkpoint. Now this checkpoint is within three hexes, so we will place a Japanese unit here in this high grass space next to it. Soviets place a tank unit near the southern fort. Japanese place the infantry unit on the road near the fort. Russians bring up more infantry. Japanese take the high grass near that particular fort.
Next, we prepare the deck of calendar cards. These are random event cards specific to each of the eight turns of the game, as indicated by the Roman numeral there. So there's three cards for each turn. So what we do is we randomly, and without looking, select one card for each of the eight turns. And we have picked one card for each of the turns and the deck is now ready to go. Now we determine initial weather conditions and we roll 1d12. And the roll is a three, that's clear weather. And here we see the effects of different types of weather. Fog reduces movement by one, air units cannot establish air superiority. With wind, the bomber's accuracy is reduced, so there's a minus one die roll modifier applied to bombing missions. And rain, clear terrain, and wetland costs one more movement point. Of course, in our example, we have clear weather. Players set up their tactical improvement displays. There's two tactical improvements, espionage and deception. Espionage allows a side to re-roll an unfavorable die roll and deception to withdraw a unit before combat. And players have to roll to see if they achieve these tactical improvements and the higher the marker is in the track, the better the chance. You see that the Soviets start with their marker one step away from the three band for espionage. And when a marker reaches a three band, a player can start rolling. And notice that the Japanese start with their marker one step away from deception. So we start by flipping the calendar card for round number one. Here we see the event. It states that um, the Soviets have to lose one strength of artillery of their choice. So they will remove a strength marker from the Soviet artillery unit that is near the hills. That takes care of the calendar event for round one. Now we determine which side has air superiority. Each side has an air base strength display and each side starts with an air base strength of seven. And to determine air superiority, the side has to determine its air strength, which is the air base strength of seven, plus the number of fighters it has, which is 14 for a total of 21. And we mark that 20 to 21 column in the air combat table. Here's the Soviet display also, an air base strength of 7 plus 14 fighters for an air strength of 21. And now each of the players will secretly select one of their air battle cards. These are cards that have a number from 0 to 8. And once a player plays one of these air battle cards, it's gone for the rest of the game. There's a 1 time only per game ability to play an additional card and to determine who would choose first if playing an additional card or not we have to roll 1d8 with the high roller being that player so let's roll for the soviets the roll is a two the japanese roll of five so the japanese will be the first player in this round so each player secretly selects a card and let's say that the japanese will be playing their number four card and they place that card face down on the table and the soviets decide to play their number five card and play that card also face down for now now both cards are revealed and we cross reference the card with the air strength of each of the sides to determine an air superiority result for the Japanese, 4 cross-reference with the 20 to 21 column is air superiority result of 10. And for the Soviets, 5 cross-reference with the 20 to 21 column is an air superiority result of 11. So the Soviets for now have air superiority 11 to 10. The Japanese is the first player and he is currently losing air superiority 10, so he has to decide whether he will play his one-time only additional card or not. He also has the option of passing and allowing the Soviet to decide whether he will play an additional card. 
and then coming back and deciding the Japanese player. The Japanese player being the first player can also pass and let the Soviets decide if they will play an additional card and whether they play an additional card or not, then the Japanese would have the final word as to playing an additional card and that's what they will do. So the Soviets are winning 11 to 10 and decide not to play an additional card. So now the Japanese player decides whether he will exercise his once in a game option of playing an additional card. In order to beat the Russian 11 in air superiority, the Japanese have to reach a card level of six. So that only takes a two card to do. So the Japanese announced they will play their additional card option so they cannot play an additional card for the rest of the game but now we add the two numbers and it's a six and when cross-reference with 20 to 21 strength six results in 12 air superiority and that beats the russian 11 so the japanese win air superiority and now we remove all the air combat cards played permanently from the game and because the japanese won air superiority now they can exercise their superiority. In the first turn, the only thing they can do is an attack, a bombing attack on the enemy air base. If this would be turn two onwards, they could do that and they can also attack Russian supply. That's uh, a way of reducing Russian political points, which are important to buy new units and replenish units in the game. Or they can also uh, use air superiority for a plus one die roll modifier in a ground combat. But for now, the Japanese will attack the Russian air base. And attacks on enemy air bases are conducted by Asides bombers, and the Japanese have 12 bombers. And the defending player rolls one D8 for every anti-aircraft gun assigned to defend the airbase and the Soviets have their three anti-aircraft guns assigned for that purpose. So the Soviets roll the D8 three times and on ones or twos they will cause hits on the Japanese bombers. The first roll is a five, that's a miss. The second roll is a one and that's a hit. And the third roll is another one, so it's two hits on the Japanese bombers. Now we reduce Japanese bomber strength from 12 to 10. So now we locate the strength of the bomber attack on the air combat table. That will be on the 10 column. And we locate the strength of the defenses on the Soviet air display. And that is the air base strength of seven plus three for each of the anti-aircraft markers that are assigned to defend the air base for a total strength of 10. So now the Japanese roll 1d8 to determine the bombing attack number. The roll is a 4 and cross-reference with the 10 column provides a result of 4. Now we roll to determine the strength of the Russian defenses. If it is less than 4 then the Japanese attack is successful. If it's equal or higher, the Japanese attack is no effect. The roll is a three and the result is a three. So the Japanese attack strength is higher than the Russian defense. The Russian air base strength is reduced to six and it now has a capacity of holding up to 30 aircraft that hasn't been exceeded because the capacity is right now at 26. So now we move on to the player turns and the Soviets always go first. So the Soviets will start moving their tank unit, which is spearheading the attack here on the Southern Ford. Spend six movement points to reach the Ford. Cost two to cross the Ford and two for the extra road. So uh, the unit has now spent 10 of his 18 movement points and spends six more for a total of 16 and now the Soviet tank unit will be attacking the Japanese infantry unit. 
Soviets have an attack value of four for tanks, plus five strength counters for a total attack value of nine. The Japanese have a defense value of three, plus a strength of five for a total defense value of eight. So it's nine to eight, and we locate those odds here in the combat results table. We mark the column and we roll 1d8. And the roll is a 3 and the result is for the defender no offensive next turn. So we mark the Japanese unit with this no offensive next turn marker. We place the marker underneath the unit. And that result means that the defending unit cannot attack in the next turn. It can move but its movement points are halved, fractions rounded up and it cannot enter enemy zones of control. And we will rotate our moving units in order to not move them twice. Next, we move an infantry unit along the road. It's full movement allowance. Now we move the other Soviet units shown here. See the Soviet artillery crossing the ford. We have two infantry units that will move next to the Kalkin Gold River and uh, they may build a bridge in the next turn and each side can build up to two bridges. Finally, we move the headquarters up front. Let's take a look at the moves here in the central sector. There's no... Uh, opposition nearby but a lot of hill territory we start moving the infantry next to the Kalkin gold river to build that second bridge now we move the tanks and the artillery and finally the headquarters so now the soviets move their units here in the northern front notice they have a tank unit with a metal and an artillery unit with a metal also those units with medals are commanded by the commanders that you see there. You have the tank unit commanded by, commanded by Shukov, and it has a minimum die roll of four. So if attacking, that unit uh, rolls less than four, we consider four as the die roll for the unit. And at the beginning of the game, each player selects three generals, and uh, they have to be of the different types shown there, armor, artillery and infantry and their total value has to be nine so we have shukov with four a generic commander with two for artillery and we have choi balsan for infantry with three so we start by moving the soviet tank unit spends 15 movement points to move adjacent to the japanese infantry unit and now we have a combat situation there total attack value of the soviet unit is nine total defense value of the Japanese is eight. So it's another attack in the same column as before. We roll one D eight. The result is a three, but because Shukov is commanding that unit, the result is an automatic four. And with a four, we have a one slash one, meaning that each side loses one strength. So we remove a strength marker for each side. That's the end of that combat situation. The remaining Soviet units now move up along the road. That concludes the movement of all the Soviet units. And now we rotate them back to their uh, regular positions. At the end of the Soviet turn, the Soviets take a number of political points equal to the score that they have on the track, which is 26. So we take these money tokens, two tens, a five, and a one. And the Soviets will be able to spend these political points for various purposes in the game, including bringing new units and upgrading units on the map. Now it's the Japanese player's turn. Japanese begin by activating the artillery unit here 
an attacking, a ranged attack against the tanks that are two hexes away. Artillery can fire and then it can move. So artillery has an attack value of four plus a strength of five, nine. The tanks have a defense of four plus a strength of five. It's also nine. So it's the white 100% column and we roll 1d8 and the result is a five. One slash one. So each side loses one strength. Now the artillery can move because it fired first. Japanese make other movements in the area, envisioning a river crossing further to the south. They set up their artillery to bombard the Russians that attempt to cross the Kalkin Gol. They bring their tanks to the south. And the two Japanese infantry units that you see here will take advantage of the high grass terrain. Here we see the position of the Japanese units in the northern sector before movement and after movement. Japanese artillery at the checkpoint will be firing at the uh, Soviet tanks that just attacked Japanese infantry. The odds are 9 to 8. Locate the 9 to 8 column. The result is a 2 defender retreats. So the Soviet tanks retreat 1 hex. Now the Japanese artillery will move so that the Soviets cannot attack it in the next round. Finally, the headquarter closes in, and that's the movement of the Japanese, their turn in the northern sector. Finally, the headquarters, marked headquarters one, moves up, and that concludes all Movements and combats by Japanese units in this round. So let's turn all units now to their correct facing. Having ended their turn, the Japanese now receive the indicated number of political points, 25. It's the end of the first round, and now we move to round two. And this is where this preview video ends. This is Kalkin Goal, a game designed by Bukashin Nishavich and to be published by Princeps Games through a Kickstarter campaign that begins on October 24. And I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.